So Tony Wright, we've spoken a lot before and it's great to have you again here. I see you've made a website which has a lot of very interesting information on it. Um, I want to start for people who don't know your theory at all with a quick explanation of what your theory about the human brain is. Is that possible? <laughs> it's so detailed. Hi, Kerry. Um, yeah, I've been I've been trying to come up with a short kind of summary for about 25 years, and I think I'm making some progress. <laughs> um, I, I always seem to complicate things because I go off in all sorts of directions, but uh, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Um, the short version is um, our new brain, our neocortex, didn't evolve on the savanna as people think. It was really a product of symbiosis. It was a co-production between the plant reproductive system and the human reproductive system. Um, basically, the plant reproductive system created a very, very different environment and our new brain grew in that and it was very, very juvenile. And it gave us all sorts of weird and wonderful new abilities and traits. And then when the relationship broke down, we lost the plant chemistry that was keeping us juvenile. And basically, our new brain has been aging. It's been becoming senile way, way before it should have done. In fact, when we're born now, it's partly on the way to being senile. Um, and it's the reason I think we're in such a mess. We're basically... We're suffering from a kind of senile dementia, and it's the reason our ancestors were talking about a slide into delusion and trying to warn us about some major per perceptual catastrophe we suffered. Um, and they don't talk about it in minor terms, you know, they talk about it in pretty serious terms. So I think, I think that's really what they were talking about. And the, 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 the weird thing is, there's actually data in the ac academic literature that that pretty much points to this. You know, there's data telling us our, our neural system is in serious trouble. What I find so compelling about this is you have the mechanism by which that happened, which seems to be missing in the rest of science. So what is it about fruit that's so unique that caused this? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's actually fairly simple, and I'll do my best again not to complicate it. So again, um, right, well, forget about fruit for a minute. You have to think of fruit botanically what fruit really is and it's a reproductive organ it's a reproductive system it's how the plant makes its new generation a bit like the mammalian uterus so that's the kind of parallel and according to all the evidence i've seen and it's generally accepted um, we our ancestors distant ancestors formed a relationship with um the plant's reproductive system it's a seed disseminating relationship and it involved us eating the reproductive organs of a whole other kingdom, which, if you think about it, is really, really weird. But what that means in terms of biochemistry, it means that once that relationship became established, our mammalian reproductive system, the mammalian uterus, was effectively, from that point on, a hybrid reproductive system. It was being permanently infused with the reproductive biochemistry of the plant kingdom. And that's really weird. That is really weird. You know, if you think about it, we think about species and they procreate and the next generation grows in their uterus or in the fruit if it's a plant or whatever. Well, in this case, it was kind of like a hybrid system. And I think that was what set us and some of our relatives apart. We were developing in a hybrid reproductive system that was flooding us with incredibly complex biochemistry, not the kind of chemistry that mammals can produce. Mammals actually don't produce anything like the chemistry plants do. And I think it created a very un a very unusual, very unique environment, generally a much more juvenile environment. And it kept all our developmental windows at a much earlier stage and allowed a brain to proliferate. And so, most important... Yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. To explain that to people quickly. So if you have your uh, age of puberty later in life, the brain has more years to proliferate cells. And that gives really quite a clear reason why the brain suddenly tripled in size in our ancestors, doesn't it? Well, I, th I think I think particularly in the uterus, it, it, it changed the normal developmental window in the uterus where there is proliferation, greatly oh, okay. amplified and expanded that. And then, yes, then I think it continued beyond birth to a significant degree. I think we've lost most of that now. And we've actually lost some of the juvenile effects in the uterus so although our brain still proliferates it doesn't proliferate as much our brain shrinking 
Um, yes. But much more importantly than that, the the change in environment, the hormonal change means relative to our past. So I emphasize relative to our symbiotic past, the brain that evolved in that environment, the new brain, our neocortex, is exposed to an aging environment. Even in the uterus, it actually starts to age relative to our ancestors, even before we're born. And there's data on this. You know, I can point yeah. people to that at some point later. So we're kind of born with a neocortex that, that originally was super juvenile and had these weird and wonderful properties that I won't go into now because it's too complicated. Um, but when, with the breakdown of this relationship, uh, as I say, our, our, our own reproductive environments become slowly more aging and it's exposed our neocortex to that aging environment. And as I say, we come out now with a relatively aged, you know, like an old age neocortex, particularly one side more than the other. And it, it's it does, it's not very functional. And by the time we get to puberty, it's pretty much toast. Our neocortex barely works at all. So this might relate to the page you have that draws a parallel to the film The Matrix. How does the uh, deterioration of our brain manifest in society? <laughs> oh my god um well okay so the matrix i i by chance i watched the matrix uh again a, a couple of months ago i think it was maybe two or three months ago i i saw it before years ago and and i think it is an excellent analogy metaphor description of how to explain living in perpetual delusion you know <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's all right it uses um you know the idea of a computer simulation and so on but it, it works pretty well and i i got me thinking since a lot of my work is about the idea that we really are living in a deluded state so i thought well how can i use that vehicle and try and weave in my ideas around the matrix so it's really just using a, a, a culturally understood vehicle that already deals with the idea that we might be deeply deluded and trying to weave the very real data from modern neurology and modern psychology in, into the the kind of context of the matrix so i've, I've really put together or i've put together a rough sort of page um challenging people and, and basically saying look the matrix draws on these ancient traditions it uses some of the ancient traditions that our ancestors were telling us we really are deluded. So I'm basically saying to the reader, can you still spot where the delusion lies? Can you tell where the real matrix is? And I've put together, you know, uh, some of the data from neurology, some of the data from psychology, a little bit from our evolutionary past. And the data is really, in my opinion, the data is telling us where to look and how deluded we are. So once you work your way through that, if you're willing to actually engage with the page, and, and take the challenge, if you like, and, and more or less test yourself, see if there's any chance you could be deluded. If you work through that page, by the time you get to the end of it, either you can tell that you're so deluded you can't see this data, or it's quite shocking. It's like, oh, my God, there's something seriously wrong with the equipment that I'm not saying generates who we are. I, I don't actually think that is the case, but certainly plays a massive role in facilitating our sense of self, our neurological matrix, that um, particular configuration of cells, subcellular structure and neuro neurochemistry that clearly plays a massive role in who and what we are. I'm saying there's something wrong with that particular matrix. In fact, it's catastrophically wrong. It's crashed. It's really in poor shape. And we're trapped in that. Our sense of self is, is constricted by that degenerate matrix and that's a sense of self we have today and we think that's normal because that's all we're used to but when you start poking around in it it starts showing you things um, and there are ways to do that I talk about that on the page but even if you don't get that far even if you just look at the data the abstract data from modern science it's telling us that actually our matrix is in really poor shape it's it's you know it's basically degenerated we've discussed in the past that because this is the instrument that people are reading this with and it's the thing that's impaired, loads of people just totally miss the point, don't they? Although I do think young people pick it up a lot quicker because they can see the problems in the world and they know there must be some cause for them. But what well, issues have you had? I mean, it's like a magic eye picture, isn't it? You either get it or you don't. <laughs> It's exactly like a magic eye picture. As I say, I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the data's there. It's already there. 
Um, I'm not, I, I don't have anything to do with that. I'm simply pointing out the patterns that I can see in the data. And if you, if you change your perspective, if you look long enough, if you're willing to see that there might be something there, it slowly starts coming into, into relief. You start and it's like, oh my God, and it was there all along. But trying to get people to look at this, it, 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 again, the reason I used this analogy is because I, I don't know if you remember the film and having watched it fairly yeah. recently, the characters talk about how how we defend the matrix, how we defend our current state of self, often with quite a hostile response. It's like we don't want to know about it or we will dismiss anything that we're not familiar with immediately and out of hand as if it couldn't possibly exist. However, um, if you do or if you are willing to challenge yourself, um, what I what I can say with an, a pretty high degree of certainty, there's more there than you think. And I've run this by as many sharp minds as I could find over the years, people who are very knowledgeable in specific fields, more knowledgeable than I am. And over time, and bit by bit, it's like, oh my God, yeah, this bit does exist, or oh my God, that bit does exist. And eventually, you know, a picture's formed that's really, really clear. But trying to get people to look at it, oh my God, although it's exactly what I'd expect as well. The data is saying we won't, we won't want to look at this. We'll want to deny it, often quite aggressively. I mean, I've had people even recently who seem they don't even want me to ask these questions it's like how <laughs> dare you how dare you ask me how is how dare you study for 25 years and dare propose these things or ask these questions well that's exactly what i'd expect so yeah. actually that kind of response is predicted however however i'm hopeful and i have seen this in microcosm that at least a percentage of of our current population have sufficient contextual capacity to, to to see this and most people have never thought about it most people have never kind of stepped back and go well hang on you know clearly our culture our our, our, our sort of default settings are insane where we're, we're committing self-extinction really we're certainly committing a lot of self-harm we're destroying the place we live we're creating the most miserable possible existence we could imagine um, and weirdly enough our ancestral traditions talk about some perceptual catastrophe some massive traumatizing disconnection from our kind of essence our source and it sounded pretty cool they often use words like divine and rupture so we were in a very different state and then they talk about our descent into delusion that's a common theme yes i know that's what it's, our ancestors it's a were telling. total preoccupation so, isn't it so so if our ancestors were saying that and our current behavior is well let's say less than sane <laughs> at best. <laughs> I, I saw, I, I guess people call them memes these days. And I saw yeah. one that I quite liked where it was, a, there was, it was an image. It's maybe it's quite common. I don't know. I don't follow these things, but there was some, some of your archetypal aliens had come out of their craft and they were talking to each other, something along the lines of, um, you know, um, Oh, they've, 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 are they intelligent? They've made u nuclear weapons. Yeah, as, yeah. As, if, as if that would be a measure of intelligence. But nevertheless, the response was, well, they've made them, but they're pointing them at themselves. You know, it's <laughs> oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, my God, that's such a perfect <laughs> example of how absolutely fucking insane we are. So anyway, my point is, it's surely worth checking out the one thing we know that plays a massive role in whether we're sane or not, our basic neural configuration. Well, once you start looking, and again, nobody's really asked this question. There's lots of data. People have been churning out data for the last 50, 100 years, and there's some great data. But you, you start looking and you find papers, and I found one recently, which uh, I, I know I've sent to you. And it's, ba it's basically saying our new modern brain that was supposed to be honed on the savannah and locked in our genes, as it mm. would be if it was the product of selective adaptation, by the time we reach puberty it starts to erode we start yeah. to lose it this is the most advanced part of our brain by the way yeah. the bit that the bit that supposedly gives us high intelligence it gives us a sense of self that's relatively unique it makes us aware of other people and other selves and so on um it starts eroding and atrophying and by the time we've reached old age more than 20 percent of it's gone that it's is like staggering that i saw this that is... and it's terrifying that's what amazes me that a lot of the people you've been in touch with over the years leading names in the field uh do agree but then they don't quite do anything with it 
there's no context, you see. I, I mean, it, it, that paper, I think that it does raise some questions and they are kind of postulating what, what might this mean? Um, and it's generally framed as well, this, this is somehow normal ageing. And it doesn't happen in animals, you said. That's not what we see elsewhere. It's virtually unique. It doesn't happen in any other species. And again, think about the contradiction. If our new brain, this this marvellous piece of equipment on top of our old brain that supposedly, you know, justifies everything that we're doing, if that was the product of selective adaptation, why is our genome, why is our DNA unable to hold it in place? Yes. Why does, why does it dis dissolve? Right. It's really bizarre. However, if it was a product of symbiosis, and bearing in mind all the data suggests we were in a symbiotic relationship for 50 million years plus, and then there's been this obsession about trying to figure out the, the very most recent part of a history on the savannah and so on, as, it, as if that's where it all happened. Well, all you have to do is tweak that a little bit and say, no, no, the brain really was the product of symbiosis. That was its origin. And whenever you see evidence on the savannah, yes, of course that happened, but these are symbiotic refugees. Their brains already stopped expanding. They're learning to survive and all the while their brain's in trouble because it was the plants and this relationship that I talked about. That's what gave us the environment to grow and run this thing. The plants were providing the design. They were providing a colossally richer neurochemistry, a lot of neuro neuroactive compounds in, 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 in this symbiotic relationship, and layer upon layer of biochemical protection, highly protected environment, and it grew this embryonic new brain. And it put us in a pretty juvenile state. I think we were playful. We were into not being aggressive, not being hierarchical. Well, that ain't going to happen on the savannah because yeah. you're going to get in about five minutes. Yeah. But if it happens in the deep, deep forest, you know, hundreds of miles from where all the big predators are and everything's provided for you. You're basically your parents of the forest, the trees quite literally in there handing you your food every day. Something magical can happen. Some kind of new species can emerge with a, a wholly, uh, it's a slight play on words, a wholly different sense of self. And I think that's what happened. Um, and the data, it fits the data very well. All that's different is our presumption, or should I say modern science's pre presumption, that to get a big brain, you must have had hostile environment. And you can understand why, because that approach has yielded some good theories, I, whether they're right or not, who knows, but some really good theories to explain lots of things. But the one thing it will not explain with any coherence is the emergence of this colossus on top of our old brain. You know, what the hell was it for? What does it do? It's never been solved. And yet, if you think symbiosis, post-symbiotic reversion, Oh, okay, right. So the complexity to build and run our brain came from the forest. If the forest disappears, we're going to be in deep shit. And that's what our ancestors have been telling us forever. It's the main but, message, isn't it? It's like the yeah. main thing we're, in religions. We and... are in deep, deep shit. And we're now in such deep shit, we don't even know we're in deep shit. And that's really serious. Like, I, you know, I think I might have said earlier, once, once we become too stupid to know how really stupid we are, then it's game over. Yeah. And I think we're teetering on the edge of that at the minute. We're really <laughs> close because we increasingly think we're more advanced because, yes. because we build nuclear weapons and point them at ourselves. You know, that's a measure of how advanced we are. Yes. But if we get much more stupid, the risk to me is we'll disappear into the abyss of unrecoverable insanity. We, we'll never know how stupid we became. We'll just, we'll just never figure out why everything went to shit. And we we basically destroyed ourselves. We blame it on we blame it on the politicians, or we blame it on yeah. this, that, and the other. When in fact, it's between our ears. And the piece of the particular piece of data that I refer to in this page is the piece I was talking about. And to me, it's the absolute epitome of a smoking gun. Yeah. It's 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 and there's even an image. You know, there's like um uh some kind of CT scan. And, and it fits perfectly. It's, it's like if you were looking for evidence of the classic fall from grace, as I said earlier, our ancestors talk about a, per a perceptual catastrophe. They're not talking about, oh, I had a headache one day and everything was a bit bad. They were talking about a massive separation from their sense of who they really were. And then a slow slide into more primitive state, into delusion and aggression and so on. That's a pretty major trauma. You know, that's that sounds to me like a blunt force injury. 
or it could be that you know that wouldn't be a surprise and then you look at what we're doing to ourselves and if you look at recorded history to me recorded history isn't about is getting more advanced it's about is getting ever more efficient at creating absolute carnage and misery yes, you know big, yeah. bigger and better war machines uh, more ability to dominate everything else and destroy it mostly so when you look at this data it's like oh yeah okay so our brains toast to me that's that's all i see it's like here's the body here's the corpse here's the evidence and it's it's basically telling us exactly what our ancestors were telling us and that our priority our absolute priority should be fixing it as soon as we possibly can yes so we wanted to keep this initial video quite short and we want people to join in don't we really if there's anything that others can do to you know pass this on uh, engage share with their thoughts get a, a discussion going that would be great i think absolutely and like i say it's a challenge if if you know if there's nothing wrong with the brain and everything's fine fantastic great news <laughs> I, I don't mind that i've wasted 20 odd years i really that, that would be fantastic if there's a well i'd still be puzzled as to what the hell we're doing but i would have no idea what the cause yes. is however if there's something seriously wrong with our brain Surely, if we want to claim we're sane, we should at least check this out. We should be giving ourselves a regular health check or our brain a regular health check. So what I'm saying to anybody watching, please visit this page. I've provided a lot of clues. You don't have to follow them. Do your own research. I would always say that, by the way, mm. do your own research. But please work your way through the page and have an open mind. At least be willing to consider the possibility that our insane behavior might just be something to do with the fact that our new brain is withering away and it's in the fucking data. That's all. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks very much.